Thank you everyone for joining today. We will get started in about five minutes at 10 o'clock. Thank you. If you're just coming in, thank you so much for joining. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. Okay, hello, and thank you to everyone around the world for joining us for this week's lab meeting. My name is Kristen Abood. I am the science editor at the Human Vaccines Project, and I will be your moderator today. 
Despite ongoing vaccination efforts, the downward trend in the number of reported cases of COVID-19 has begun to level off in many countries. Experts largely attribute this to spread of what is now known as the Delta variant of SARS-CoV-2 among those who are unvaccinated. This variant of concern, which was first identified in India, is now circulating in 74 countries and is even more transmissible than the alpha variant that was first identified in the UK. In Britain, rising cases due to the Delta variant may stall efforts to lift COVID restrictions. On a positive note, the US company Novavax released efficacy data this week from its phase three clinical trial in the US and Mexico, confirming results from a smaller trial and showing that the two shot protein based vaccine was 90% effective overall and 100% effective at preventing moderate and severe disease. The company may not immediately apply for emergency use authorization in the US, where there are now three authorized COVID-19 vaccines, but plans to seek authorization in Britain, the EU, India, and South Korea. Having an additional vaccine available could help ease some of the supply issues that have hindered global access. Before we get started with today's presentation, I wanted to note that this is the last chance to apply for the Michelson Prizes Next Generation Grants. The application portal closes tomorrow, June 18th. Presented by the Human Vaccines Project and the Michelson Medical Research Foundation, the Michelson Prizes are given to support promising young researchers who are applying disruptive concepts and innovative methodologies to advance human immunology, vaccine discovery, and immunotherapy research for major global diseases. We're posting the link to the Michelson Prizes in the chat, so please visit the site for more information or to apply. Just one more note before we begin. The information presented today includes some pre-published data that is currently under peer review. At the request of our speaker, we ask that you not reproduce or disseminate the data presented. This session will be recorded and made available on our website and our social media channels for you to review. And with that, I am happy to introduce today's speakers, Dr. Daniela Weisskopf and Dr. Alessandra Setti from the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. Dr. Daniela Weisskopf has devoted her career to understanding T cell responses to viral pathogens. In 2009, she received her PhD in immunology from Innsbruck Medical University in Austria, and then obtained postdoctoral training at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology, where she characterized human dengue virus specific CD8 and CD4 T cell responses to infection and following vaccination. She further expanded her repertoire to study Zika and chikungunya virus specific T cell responses. As a research assistant professor in the Center for Infectious Diseases and Vaccine Research at LJI, she focused most recently on the characterization of SARS CoV 2 specific T cell responses. Dr. Alessandro Sete has devoted more than 35 years in biotech and academia to understanding and measuring immune responses and developing disease intervention strategies against cancer, autoimmunity, allergy, and infectious diseases. Dr. Sete's laboratory is the world leader in the study of the specific structures called epitopes that the immune system recognizes. He has overseen the design and curation efforts of the National Immune Epitope Database, a freely available, widely used bioinformatics resource. His lab uses knowledge of epitopes to define the hallmarks of a beneficial immune response associated with effective vaccines. The laboratory has several infectious disease interests, including SARS-CoV-2, dengue, Zika, chikungunya, herpes viruses, loss of fever, and HIV, among others. Dr. Sete is a doctor in biological sciences from the University of Rome. He worked with the company Cytel and founded the company Epimmune, where he served both as vice president of research and chief scientific officer until 2002, when he joined LJI as head of the division of vaccine discovery. He also heads the Center for Infectious Diseases at LJI. During the presentation, please send me your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. I will ask our speakers a broad selection of your questions after their presentations, and we will have about 25 minutes for discussion. 
It is my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Weisskopf and Dr. Sete. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. I will uh, go ahead and share my screen. So as you have been, as you heard, um, both Alex and I will present our most recent research data on the adaptive immune response against SARS-CoV-2 today. And um, I will get us started to summarize everything that we have learned so far in the last year. And this is basically the group of people um, I spent the last 18 months with. Um, you will hear from Alex later, but then all of these people have been involved um, in the studies that we're presenting today. Shane Crotty, um, Alison uh, Tarke, Alva Grifoni, John Sidney, Jose Mateos, April Fraser, Bjorn Peters, and Jennifer Dan have all been involved in everything that is presented to you today. And I just wanted to acknowledge uh, them in the first slide. So early on in this pandemic, we were interested in answering the question if uh, infected people um, with SARS-CoV-2 actually have T-cell responses against this virus. And early on, we realized, yes, they do. Um, all of the donors that have been infected against COVID-19 do recognize um, the spike protein and also um, other parts of the virus. And the same is true for TD8 T cells, although it's uh, a, some, a little bit lower, not 100%, but 70% uh, recognized the virus. So this was good news because like back then already a lot of vaccines, including the spike protein were recognized. So what was not known and what we focused our interest in next is um, what are the individual epitopes that are recognized by this virus? Because this has all been done on basic epitope pools. So we do not know what is the actual sequence that is recognized. And that is what we were interested in identifying next. So we assembled a cord of 99 different um, COVID-19 convalescent subjects. Um, they were representative of disease severities and ethnicities in the local population. So we made sure we had everything from like more mild to like more severe cases in there. We developed a screening strategy based on overlapping peptide pools, um, spending the entire gene genome because we did not want to only identify epitopes from uh, the spike protein, but from the entire virus. Once we knew which proteins are recognized in a given donor, we then deconvoluted these and identified the actual epitope sequence. Um, we also accounted for HLAs expressed in our cord, but also representative of the worldwide population so that we made sure we not only identify epitopes um, that are applicable for the population here in Southern California, but also like, you know, uh, represent HLA alleles present worldwide. Um, we screened the overlapping 15 mares and that allows the coverage of all HLA class two responses, irrespective of HLA, um, in addition to like the class one where we accounted for the most of representative worldwide. So for a class one, we selected 28 class, one alleles and they cover at least three out of four of the alleles in 75 percent of our donors so we had a very comprehensive system um, to identify um, the specific epitopes so as i mentioned before the initial screening was like uh, to identify the proteins people recognized and this is the um, results from this screen so you can see um, we screened all of the non-structural proteins and the structural proteins, of course, spike and also, but also like envelope, um, the matrix and other orbs that are recognized, that are um, consistent of the structural um, parts of the virus. And these are the results for CD4 and CD8. You can see here um, that spike is highly um, recognized in the majority of the donors, but also other proteins like the nucleocapsid and the membrane are highly recognized for CD4 T cell responses. And if you look into CD T cells, again, spike was highly recognized um, out of all of these proteins. Again, uh, membrane and nucleocapsid highly recognized. And also non-structural protein three was like strongly recognized for CD8 T cell response. This is like important if you think about the next generation vaccines when, when you decide to like add another protein other than spike to this, there's more than one protein that are highly recognized by T cells. As a matter of fact, if you look into the number of donors, and this is shown here on the right side, so the number of positive donors that recognized um, CD4 or CD8 T cells, three, three of the different antigens are recognized, three or more of the different antigens are recognized by the average donor. So that's, uh, that's important. So overall, 
when we then deconvolute and identify the individual um, epitopes, we identify 280 different CD4 restricted epitopes and uh, 523 different CD8 epitopes. And the other important point I wanted to point out that uh, each individual epitopes recognize multiple epitopes and antigens, but also different individual epitopes. So this is important um, for the later part of the presentation um, when we're talking about um, the viral um, uh, variants that are circulating now. So there is multiple proteins and multiple epitopes recognized by each individual donors. So if you look into more detail, this is uh, shown as an example for CD4 e T cell epitopes. Um, we, saw, we found 280 epitopes identified. 45% of these donors are promis epitopes are promiscuous. So that means they are recognized in three or more donors. So you can see that um, um, they accounted for like 45% of the responses. 60%, 26% or 60 epitopes are identified and recognized by two or more donors. And uh, there's 171 epitopes recognized by one donor. So overall, we have a very comprehensive landscape of epitopes recognized. Um, we restrict, the, we inferred HLA restriction for 178 of them, and the most dominant epitopes are promiscuous. So they are not only recognized in many of the donors, but they are also like strongly recognized in terms of magnitude. So um, as I said, we have inferred restriction for most of them, and this is all like published and is accessible um, uh, online. Uh, in terms of um, CD8 teaser responses, I mentioned that we were making sure that we account for the majority of like HLA A and B alleles. And what was interesting here is that we actually saw a broad diversity depending on the HLA allele that is presented. So we have um, alleles that are frequently recognizing SARS-CoV-2 alleles and then respond with a strong magnitude. So for example, the AO1 allele, 10% um, of the donors that have carrying this allele recognize the peptide, but when they do recognize an epitope, they respond strongly to it. We also have the um, a different case, for example, here in the A6801, where like the majority of donors that carry this allele do recognize an epitope and the response magnitude is somewhat lower, but still like very well recognized. So overall, it's important to study like um, all of these responses based on a per allele basis because you have such a diversity in responses. And that is something we have also seen uh, on other viruses we are studying. So it's important to look into in more detail like what are the individual epitopes uh, recognized and what are um, the ones that are. Um, uh, what is the response associated with them? So then we took all of this information and made uh, pools again, uh, so we can study the um, COVID-19 responses. And the advantage of like um, formulating pools um, to study this is allow it allows you to study these responses in small volumes of samples, which are available typically for like people that are hospitalized or also vaccine trials. And this is a comparison um, how our pools perform. So these are the pools we have been using originally, where we used uh, predictions or overlapping strategy um, to identify the epitopes. And now we have identified experimental pools, so the CD4E and the CD8E pool that I mentioned here um, is now tested against um, the other pools. And this is a pool that has been published uh, by a collaborator, by somebody, some other lab. And just so putting in context, what are the pools that have been used and known so far? And you can see that the pools we have identified now based on experimental strategy have a high sensitivity and specificity um, in our COVID-19 donors, which is shown here. And as a comparison, we have always tested um, these responses in unexposed donors, and you can see that also unexposed donors um, recognize uh, some of these pools. So in summary, um, for our epitope identification of COVID-19 donors, I told you that we identified a wide uh, variety of um, sequences, 280 CD4 epitopes, more than 500 CD8 epitopes. Importantly, each individual recognized multiple epitopes and antigens. Um, um, on average, 15 to 20 epitopes are recognized for each donor. There is a clear immunodominant region for CD4 responses, um, as I've been um, showing you. Um, interestingly, the RBD region of the spike protein itself is epitope poor, but the neighboring regions are in co-dominant sites. We did not see a correlation with uh, common cold um, epitopes. Uh, and I will talk to this in just a second. And the HLA binding was one of the main correlate of immunogenicity, no correlation with processing cleavage sites. So we have not 
we have also published this study and and we also have been showing you that we measured these app we now manufacture these epitopools that facilitate the measurement of tissue responses in small amounts of samples so what i have briefly mentioned and what we have um, uh, recognized early on is that um, the reactivity, T cell reactivity, particularly for CD4, is also detected in non-exposed individuals. And that is shown here. So you can see all of these donors have never been exposed to COVID-19, but do recognize COVID-19 peptides. And this is something that we were interested in, and we wanted to um, see what are the actual sequences recognized here. And as I mentioned, we were very sure that these donors have not ever been exposed to this virus because we collected them before the pandemic between March 2015 and March 2018. And additionally, we also, of course, run um, IgG ELISA to make sure that they do not have antibodies. So they have, we are very certain that they have never been exposed to this. Um, this is just quickly showing you the strategy we have been using, very similar to what I've just been telling you before. We um, used a pool strategy where we identified um, pools first and then deconvolute positive pools down to the individual um, epitope. In contrast to what we have, the strategy we have been doing for SARS-CoV-2 exposed donors, where we could identify all the epitopes ex vivo, um, we needed um, a 14-day re-stimulation of these, of these peptides in unexposed donors because the frequency of response was just much lower. So, but we were following the same strategy of uh, deconverting pools and identifying um, individual epitopes using this strategy. Overall, um, we identified um, more than 100 different epitopes. Again, uh, the number of epitopes recognized by donors was bright, bright, uh, quite broad. So we identified everything from five to like more than 30 for each individual donor. And again, we saw epitopes that were promiscuous being recognized in more than three donors, more than two or individual um, donors. And if you look in the percentage of the overall response, again, um, promiscuous epitopes account for one third of them, um, another third for like uh, epitopes recognized in two or more, and then the remaining of the response accounted for like about 45%. What we realized, uh, what we were interested in, like what is, where is this cross-reactive response coming from? Because I just convinced you that these donors have never seen SARS-CoV-2 yet responded. So we performed a sequence uh, homology with uh, most closely related viruses, which are the human common cold viruses that are very um, similar um, and from the same family as SARS-CoV-2. And we identified that sequence homology is strong um, with these identified epitopes. But that was uh, uh, something that we were interested in looking more detail. So we synthesized these homologs for SARS-CoV-2 of all the epitopes we identified from uh, any of these four common cold coronaviruses and made two pools. We basically uh, made 124 spike homologs for the common cold viruses and 129 non-spike homologs. And if you then test these pools in unexposed donors, you see that they recognize these homologs that have been synthesized based on the sequence um, homology uh, even better and stronger than the SARS-CoV-2. So this was our first um, hint that the cross-reactive response that we do detect is actually in fact um, derived from SARS-CoV-2. If you then as a control look into COVID-19 donors, you can see that uh, um, these cross-reactive responses have identified are strongly, more strongly responded into COVID-19 uh, donors than the homologs. So, if you are a true um, pre-existing immune memory response, then by definition, you have to be derived from the immune memory. So this is what we identified next. So these are markers that are used to identify T cell memory um, based on these two markers. And in fact, for any of these cross-reactive responses, we identified that they are truly derived from the memory response. Final experiment that we wanted to show is that the uh, not only do they have a strong sequence homology, we wanted to show that they actually do also induce responses. So we made T cell lines with the original SARS-CoV-2 epitope that was identified. And these are the homolog responses from the other common cold viruses that I've been just telling you. And we actually demonstrate that they are uh, responded equally or even better than the SARS-CoV-2 sequence. So all of that convinced us um, that, uh, or demonstrated and convinced hopefully you also that uh, these are truly memory responses that are derived from common cold viruses 
and that are have the ability to cross react with uh, um, SARS-CoV-2. What was interesting that uh, now that we knew exactly the epitope that was induced by COVID-19 and also in unexposed donors, the overlap was not um, so, so big. So of, of all the epitopes we identified, there were 53 that actually have this, this, uh, sequence simil this sequence similarity in exposed and unexposed. But the majority of the repertoire is actually novel induced by the virus. So in conclusion, I just like to summarize what I've been just showing you. We identified reactivity also in non-exposed donors, and that was all not only done by our lab, but we have been reproduced in uh, the labs around the world in different continents. So this is a true statement, not for the population we studied here, but also like around the world. Um, we showed that non-exposed uh, reactivity maps to cross reactivity with common cold viruses, at least in some of the cases. And, and we are now interested in like, does this pre-existing reactivity influence immunity? Um, I showed you that there is a good overlap, but the, that there's also a lot of individual epitopes that are induced by SARS-CoV-2. So that is something that um, we are actively working on. And uh, the knowledge of these epitope repertoires now also allows you to like ask questions in terms of like, uh, new variants that are emerging, and that is um, what Alex is updating you now um, in the next uh, talk. I just want to mention briefly that um, we have been freely sharing our reagents. So far, we have been sharing this with 132 different laboratories so far, as you can see from all around the world, except um, Antarctica. So if you know a lab there, we're happy to share that too. And then we have truly shared um, a global effort of our um, polls. So with this, I'm going to hand over to um, Alex. Stop sharing my screen. We will update you on the second part of the presentation. Thank you, Daniela. And uh, let me share my screen. You're seeing it, right? Okay, yeah, so um, in the second part of the talk, as Daniela was uh, mentioning, we'd like to uh, discuss uh, some uh, data uh, that uh, we generated in relation to T cell responses to um, uh, the uh, variants of concerns. So uh, variants of concern, of course, are uh, being um, <clears throat> discussed very uh, widely. Uh, and uh, here you see some of the, uh, uh, main points. Uh, there are different variants of concerns that uh, now actually have been reclassified according to the Greek alphabet. Uh, but um, many of these variants of concerns are associated with uh, increased transmissibility, as was mentioned earlier on. And uh, these variants are associated with uh, mutations that uh, really span the entire proteome, but uh, mutations that are of particular concern are the ones contained in BS protein because uh, this uh, may indeed uh, uh, mediate the effect of uh, increased uh, infectivity and so forth for transmissibility. And in addition, uh, may uh, indeed also be linked to uh, escape from um, the antibody response and the neutralizing antibody response, which uh, targets, of course, the same uh, uh, spike region, but is uh, involved in uh, the process of uh, infecting uh, the human cells. Uh, the data uh, relating to uh, vaccine efficacy is uh, continues to come in uh, almost on a daily basis. And basically from uh, the high level uh, has been uh, reported and seen that the existing vaccines have uh, can have a, a reduction in efficacy, uh, but is dependent also on the particular variant uh, considered. But uh, encouraging, as also was uh, mentioned uh, in the context of the Novavax uh, recent uh, data release, uh, the vaccine seems to really retain efficacy uh, against uh, death and severe disease and hospitalization. And uh, this is an important point that uh, we will uh, discuss in more detail in a second. So uh, this is uh, again, not our data uh, from, this is from a, a, a recent uh, 
preprint, but I'm just showing it here to illustrate with different variants uh, and the effect on uh, neutralizations of the mutations contained with uh, variants. Uh, these are some of the uh, more uh, common uh, variants. Of the, uh, this doesn't include the uh, Delta variant as yet, both in these experiments and in our experiments that uh, I'm, um, I'm going to show you, but the experiments with uh, the uh, other additional variants are in progress. Uh, but bottom line, the point I want to make is whether you look at convalescent plasma or at uh, people that have received uh, the Pfizer vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine in this particular case, uh, you do see uh, reductions that range from uh, a couple uh, twofold or so to uh, tenfold in, in the case particularly of the uh, B1351 uh, variant. Now, what about T cells? Uh, and uh, in order to put the discussion around T cells in context, just want to mention a few uh, points. So, first of all, early CD4 and CD8 T cells are associated with milder disease. And we reported extensively on this uh, uh, association in a um, paper in Cell uh, last year. This data has also been uh, confirmed exactly by Bertoletti's group from Singapore, which again saw that people that develop early T cell responses do better. Uh, and people with uh, severe disease are associated in a uh, defect in T cell response, particularly in the early phase. Um, also, uh, it's uh, quite apparent that the people that have uh, uh, little to no uh, antibody response, either because they have a genetic defect, uh, um, the agama globulinemia, or uh, a pharmaceutical intervention that has been, uh, because of uh, oncological considerations, has uh, inhibited the, and, uh, the uh, B cell responses, uh, nevertheless can experience uncomplicated COVID. So you can clear the uh, uh, virus uh, without uh, an antibody response. This is not meant to say that antibody responses are not important. We do want to have antibody responses, but it's meant to say that T cells can play an important role. Uh, of course, CD4 and CD8 T cell memories are induced after COVID and also after vaccination. We have studies in progress, there are also uh, studies that uh, came out uh, in the literature really illustrating that the vaccination induces T cell responses. Uh, finally, uh, the other point from this uh, uh, paper in Cell Med, again from uh, Bertoletti's group, uh, highlights uh, the fact that the onset of protection following vaccination doesn't correlate with the onset of a neutralizing antibody response. So it seems to correlate more with the onset of a T cell response. Based on all this uh, uh, data in aggregate, we think uh, it is important to understand uh, the uh, impact, potential impact of uh, the mutations found in the variants on T cell responses. So uh, to address this point, what we did is we synthesized overlapping peptide spoon, uh, pools spanning the entire proteome of the different variants. And we did this because we wanted to really have a comprehensive understanding of the impact of uh, these all mutations contained, whether in spike or elsewhere, on T cell recognition. And we chose two uh, different approaches, uh, either the uh, activation-induced marker assays that uh, Daniela has showed you uh, before, or also a classic uh, fluorospot assay looking at Th1 and Th2 responses. Uh, and so these pools were tested in these two different uh, assay methodologies uh, with PBNCs derived from either uh, people infected with the uh, early on, so with the ancestral sequence, and uh, or uh, vaccinated, and we looked at uh, people vaccinated with either Pfizer or Moderna. So these are uh, all the different uh, uh, mutations that are found in the different uh, variants, and uh, we synthesize the overlapping peptides containing them, plus also obviously all, any overlapping peptide that did not contain any mutation. Uh, and as I was mentioning here, we looked at the COVID convalescence. So 
we, in, in truth, we do not know what is the specific viral uh, sequence, uh, the sequence of a specific virus that infected these convalescent people, but we took care to uh, study people that were infected before October 2020. So before uh, the, uh, the variants had uh, spread in the uh, California region from which we were uh, recruiting our convalescents. And of course, uh, uh, COVID vaccines. And also uh, we looked at unexposed individuals. Again, as uh, Daniela has pointed out, the uh, study of convalescent individuals where uh, the PBNC were collected before 2018 allows you to uh, 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 study uh, people where you uh, are confident that these uh, uh, people were not associated with uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. So what does the data look like? So here is data, first set of data, convalescent uh, uh, people, uh, and this is a response against spike. And you see here, uh, these are the different variants and each um, symbol is a person. And then here you have your geometric mean and you see uh, that in reality, there is not uh, a significant decrease either for CD4 or CD8 response uh, with any of the variants. Here's the data with the Ellis spot. And you see here in the Ellis spot that overall the responses are uh, not uh, impacted uh, much uh, in a uh, um, vast majority of response is retained. Uh, there are some significant uh, decreases here for uh, some of these variants, but we pointed out that the decreases are going from 44, 45 spots to 39, 42, or 38 spots per million. So these decreases are um, at least, uh, at most, like, uh, a point twofold. So, in, <laughs> put it in the context of what uh, we've seen with the antibody responses, where the decreases are much more substantial. Uh, the pattern of Th1 versus Th2 is maintained. The response is all Th1. This was a concern because it has been uh, uh, widely appreciated that uh, when you have substitutions that could alter the pattern of uh, cytokine production from the responding T cells. But we, in this case, this is, uh, uh, is, not, is not the case. So the response is maintained and is maintained also TH1. We also looked at the same question in a different way, uh, looking at uh, the avidity of the T cells uh, that respond to either the ancestral uh, uh, sequence or the um, variant uh, sequences uh, to see if, uh, there was a change in avidity, so we titrated down the antigen using the assay, and uh, you see here with uh, those response, and there is really no difference between the uh, dose response of the T cells from convalescent individual and responding to spike um, and the different variants. So what about recent vaccinees? A very similar picture. Uh, Again, in general, the response is largely maintained. Uh, it's largely Th1. There's a, a little bit of uh, uh, IL-5 detected, but when you look at what fraction of the response is uh, uh, associated with the uh, uh, Th1 interferon gamma uh, producing cells is again in the 80 to 90%. Uh, as I was saying, some, some decreases here, the same, uh, picture where we do see significant decreases in the terms of uh, statistical significance, but the decreases are uh, limited to 20% uh, uh, of a total response or something on that uh, neighborhood. And again, no uh, decrease uh, no, in uh, the antigen sensitivity of the response. Uh, so we can look at uh, this data in a different way. Uh, as I was saying, looking at the fold change of a T cell response against the different variants here. You see that uh, in natural infection uh, against uh, uh, spike for CD4, CD8, or uh, early spot, the differences in actually in the CD4 aim, the responses are slightly higher, uh, in a couple of cases slightly lower. And again, in some cases in the uh, early spot, you see this decreases that is 1.1, 1.2 fold. So 
uh, the vast majority of it, the response is uh, retained and similar pictures is uh, absurd if you look at the vaccinated individuals. Um, as I was mentioning, we did uh, look at the overall response to the entire virus in convalescent individuals. Of course, in a, a vaccinated individual, they only respond to spike because that's the only thing they've seen. And uh, uh, here, uh, paradoxically, when you look at the global uh, response, the response against uh, the different variants of concerns from the convalescent individual is slightly uh, increased. So you see, again, an increase maybe of uh, about 20% uh, or so for CD4 and uh, can be a, a little bit more uh, significant for CD8. But again, uh, not approaching a twofold uh, or more that we see in the antibody response. So this is essentially uh, summarized here. Uh, in many cases, we see absolutely no effect. In some cases, we do see a uh, reduction in the uh, T cell activity that is limited to uh, about at best 20 to 30% of the uh, total response. Um, and no change in sensitivity and no change in polarization. So just to point out uh, uh, some of the limitation of the studies, uh, we used overlapping peptide pools in this uh, uh, context. So it's possible that some of the mutations associated with the variants may alter uh, antigen processing, and we would not be <clears throat> uh, privy to that. And <clears throat> the uh, approach was, uh, that was taken here was specifically designed to look at the overall response. So it is quite likely and possible that there may be specific epitopes that are uh, altered. And this may have a significant impact for that particular epitope in one particular donor that expresses that HLA. Uh, uh, and I was pointing out earlier, we don't know uh, what were the sequences uh, that infected the convalescent with specific viral variant, uh, but we studied early samples and also we see exactly the same picture when we look at vaccinees where, of, of course, we know what the, is the sequence that those vaccinees were um, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in injected with. And finally, one experiment we're quite interested in doing is to do the uh, opposite, if you wish, experiments. So to look at people that are infected with variants, how do they cross-react with other variants um, and so forth. So uh, Daniela already showed you the uh, data in the identification of responses uh, and the specific epitope from COVID vaccinees. And so in that context, then that allowed us to look back and say, okay, for we define epitopes, how many of the epitopes that have been defined have mutations? And whether you look at the number of uh, epitopes or where you look at the magnitude of a response associated with those epitopes, the picture is essentially the same. 90 to 98% of the known epitope described in the Tarki et al. paper uh, are totally conserved uh, in uh, the different variants. Again, uh, fitting nicely with the data that we've generated at the uh, wet lab level, this is a bioinformatic analysis. Of course, there are some uh, individual epitopes that have uh, one or uh, more mutations. Um, in the case of class one, we were able to look uh, at, uh, because they uh, the restriction is well-defined, we were able to look at the mutations with impact uh, binding uh, or not. Uh, in the majority of the cases, we don't see a significant effect of binding, but there are cases where the mutation is associated with decreased binding, so above the diagonal here. There are cases actually where also the mutation is associated with the increased binding. Um, recently, we performed a meta-analysis uh, where we looked at the more broadly what the scientific community had defined as in terms of uh, epitopes uh, from SARS-CoV-2. 
And uh, as of March 15, when we uh, uh, finalized this meta-analysis were 25 different studies that had described epitopes. Now we are up to 30 and more. And uh, bottom line in both studies, uh, there are uh, now a pre uh, approaching 2000 different epitopes, certainly more than 1500. And that means that the response breath of humans in terms of the T-cell response against SARS-CoV-2 is very, very large. And what this means is they're gonna be very, very difficult at the population level for SARS-CoV-2 to mutate, to escape recognition from CD4 and CD8 T cells. It's just, a, it, it's a, a very, very large hundreds, thousands of different epitopes being recognized. Uh, Daniela already showed you the uh, type of analysis that uh, one can do and uh, this data continues to uh, come in. And uh, these are graphs generating using the immunobrowser at the immunoepitope database that constantly catalogs uh, the data coming in in the uh, literature in uh, essentially real time. And uh, for example, Daniela already pointed out to the fact that the, the RBD is relatively epitope poor, poor for CD4, but not for CD8. These are patterns from some of the other uh, proteins that are uh, frequently recognized in SARS-CoV-2 infected people. And again, a large number of epitopes, specific regions that are uh, recognized prominently by T cells, but uh, the breadth of a response in humans is very large. This is also illustrated by this graph. So what, what is this graph? This is the number of epitopes uh, that we detected in the meta-analysis that was uh, published uh, uh, earlier on as a function of the different HLA alleles for class one or class two. And this is a well-known uh, phenomenon of uh, investigational bias. So people tend to study alleles that are most frequent. And for example, in the case of HLA class one, everybody studies A211. Not surprisingly, there are hundreds of epitopes that have been described for A2.1, while if you are uh, A4301, you're out of luck because nobody studies you <laughs> because maybe this allele is less frequent. But the point I wanna make is not that there is anything intrinsically uh, that we have to uh, expect that the alleles that are less studied have less epitopes. So if people would study uh, with the same degree of uh, uh, focus over different alleles, probably these numbers would be across the board in the several hundreds. So we're just scratching the surface here of how many epitopes are actually recognized in human populations in different ethnicities in different situations. Uh, so uh, this is essentially uh, the, uh, this is the last slide that uh, reiterates this points that uh, uh, mutation associated with variants of concerns uh, have been uh, evaluated at the global level in vaccinees, in convalescent people, and uh, the uh, effects that have been detected are uh, uh, in, in, in many of the uh, variant assay combinations, 25 out of 32, there was no significant decrease. Uh, there were some uh, decrease in activity in seven cases, which uh, range from a, a 1.06 to a 1.21 fold range. So essentially 80 to 90% of the response is still retained in this uh, in these cases. This jives with the fact that the, the mass majority of defined epitopes are 100% conserved uh, for uh, both CD4 and CD8 in, and whether you look at the genome globally or spike only. A uh, very large number of epitopes have been identified by the scientific community to date. Uh, and this uh, also uh, leads us to conclude that at population level, it's very unlikely that variants uh, can escape this large breadth of responses. And with that, uh, I would thank you. And uh, Danielle and I would be happy to uh, entertain some questions. Fabulous. Thank you both. We were really lucky to not have just one outstanding speaker today, but two. 
So thank you both. We have uh, quite a few questions coming in, so I will launch right in. Oh, the first question was whether you've been able to follow the expansion of epitope specific T cells in longitudinal samples to see how they expand over the course of COVID-19 infection. Um, well, that is an interesting question. We have not done uh, that. Um, the epitope identification studies require uh, usually a large amount of uh, uh, blood. So uh, it's difficult to get. So you can either get a little blood a lot of times <laughs> or a lot of blood <laughs> one time. Uh, so uh, after saying that, well, there have been studies, for example, again, from the Bertoletti's group that have, and others that have pointed out using peptide pools more than uh, uh, specific epitopes that some of the uh, pattern of uh, uh, epitope recognition may change over time. So it's, it's a very interesting thing to look at. Right. So two, two related questions with regard to vaccines. Um, one is if the RBD region is epitope, T-cell epitope poor, are RBD only based vaccines the best approach? And related to that, do inactivated vaccines um, generate more epitope specific responses, T-cell responses? Um, do you want to take that? Daniela or take it? No. Yeah, sure, I can, uh, I can answer that. So um, as, as we pointed out by identifying the actual epitopes, um, CD4, RBD is not very much recognized by CD4 T cells, but it's recognized by CD8 T cells. So you do have a response, um, you do have a T cell response, and of course it's the, it's the prime region for antibody recognition. So if you want more T cell epitopes, and we don't know like how many do you need, right? What's the response is required? So um, that will be like, you know, when you actually study these vaccines, then we can maybe get a better idea and then also combine that with um, data from protection, um, then you can answer that question. But so there is epitopes in the RBD region for CD8 T cells for sure. Okay, thank you. We have a question about when you stimulate with peptides, are these peptides processed by antigen presenting cells or are they directly detected by T cells? So um, the, uh... I guess we <clears throat> we need to define what stimulate with peptide means. Uh, so what we uh, use is a uh, most of the time is this aim assay, where the stimulation is really an ex vivo. It's a it's a short. It's at a, a, a maximum twenty four hours. So in that context, is really you're not really immunizing, you're not <clears throat> stimulating the cells to divide. You're detecting the response. Uh, and in, in those cases, the peptide is not processed, actually. If the peptide would be processed, would be destroyed uh, by the APC. So what happens is the peptide binds to the cell surface of APCs, or actually even T cells, activated T cells express DR, of course, express plus one. And then the T cells uh, uh, recognize that. Now, uh, this issue <clears throat> is non-trivial in the sense that Forget about processing, but from the T cell point of view, <clears throat> the T cell, depending on what you're looking at, the T cell needs a little bit of time to uh, become activated. Some markers come up very uh, fast, while other markers, or for example, production of cytokines, if you look too early, <clears throat> say after two hours, you won't see gamma very well you need to wait a little bit because it's, the cell needs to make gamma. It's not making gamma all the time. Uh, then the other point is the data that uh, Daniela showed you. Uh, we and others in conditions where the T cells we are uh, trying to detect are very rare, you may em uh, employ a two week re-stimulation to expand the number of cells. And so, uh, that is uh, uh, different, but also in that case, if you use peptides, those are not likely to be processed, likely to be a, a, a direct stimulation of a peptide binding to the uh, uh, surface of an antigen presenting cells. If you use protein, <clears throat> then that, that's obviously, it, it's different, that will be processed. Right. 
Right. <clears throat> Coming back to vaccines, we have a question on have the T cell responses been assessed for the Moderna vaccine or other vaccines besides AstraZeneca's and how do they compare to Pfizer's? Well, um, <clears throat> ask me again in a couple of months. Uh, <clears throat> Daniela, we'll invite you back. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Daniela, Shane Crowdy, and I uh, are uh, involved in studies where we will actually be able to compare uh, side by side uh, the different uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca, even though AstraZeneca obviously is not authorized in the US. Uh, but, um, and also Novavax and essentially whatever vaccine we can <clears throat> get and we can uh, do uh, a comparative study on a side-by-side -side thing. And, and the purpose here is not to give scorecards and say, you know, <laughs> this vaccine gets an A and this one gets a B uh, right. because all the vaccine have been uh, very good and we need all the vaccine we can have, but this is also, again, in uh, the human vaccine project context, right? <clears throat> this is a very unfortunate situation to have had this pandemic, but one of the side uh, products of this is that you have so many different platforms that have been tested in millions of people. And so we can actually now have a real understanding the different platforms, and it's very likely that some platform will be better in inducing uh, uh, CD4 versus CD8 or antibodies. We may have different in the duration of immune response, and where. so it's really a tool to understand what different vaccine platforms do, and that's going to be a lesson that is going to be long-lasting for other uh, vaccine uh, development. Yeah, yeah, that's that's hugely important, really. Um, so another question on the pre-existing T cell responses: Is there any evidence that they provide benefit to the vaccine-induced responses, um, either for COVID or for other vaccines? And relatedly to that, um, in aging subjects where T cell immunity may wane, um, is there any impact for the data of pre-existing T cell immunity to enhance the vaccine-induced responses? Yeah, these are great questions, and that's actually um, questions we are actively working on because they have su they could have such a big um, impact. So, but going back to the first question, if pre-existing immune memory has anything to has any benefit of subsequent infection or vaccination, that's a really important question, and we are looking at this right now. And we we are using vaccine samples to do just that. And the reason we're doing that is because vaccine samples actually allow you to like compare a response before the vaccine and then see um, how it changes when you then get the vaccination. It's much more difficult to do that in natural infection because you need to collect blood samples from a large population and then wait until they unfortunately get or cannot get infected and then follow them up. So we are using actually the vaccine samples to, to answer that question. And we are interested in doing that right That And the other question is, does that change with age? That's an important question. So we are, have actively been recruiting um, um, patients for, uh, ranging from 18 to like 88 to, to see if there is a difference in uh, in these in these um, cells that are able to cross react. So um, these are great questions. We have the same. We don't have all the answers yet, but hopefully <laughs> soon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I guess related to that, um, given that the vaccination maybe induces lower neutralizing antibody levels in the elderly than in the younger populations, would that be true as well for the T cell responses? Would you anticipate? Um, so we know that that's difficult, that that's different, the aging immune system is different, but like it has not been studied actively like in this context, so we don't know yet. Right, right. And so we have a question about the early protection that's afforded by vaccines, and do you think that that's due to innate immunity or perhaps T cell responses? Well, the... Innate immunity uh, uh, is non-antigen specific. Uh, after saying that, certainly there are uh, data that uh, relate to trained immunity and the, that uh, a vaccination could also uh, 
augment innate immunity. But I think from the uh, all we know, it's uh, uh, much more likely that the early uh, protection may be mediated by uh, T cells, or actually how it is also pointed out in that uh, Bertoletti paper I was referring to, there are also non-neutralizing antibodies that come out sooner than the neutralizing antibody. And that is something that is also uh, very much uh, debated, um, that they could also either uh, synergistically uh, have an effect on the early uh, vaccine protection. The uh, point that uh, uh, is uh, worth underlying that there is data suggesting, particularly uh, in the case of a Delta variant, that uh, one shot uh, may not afford as uh, good a protection as uh, two shots. So again, uh, people, if you got a shot, come back for the second one. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't skip out. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, and I, I have a feeling this is going to be another one we'll need to come back to you on. But what do we know about how long T cell memory remains after COVID-19 infection? Yeah. So after, sorry, go ahead, Daniela, take that if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So we have been looking into exactly that. So we have been following uh, um, people after COVID-19 infection up to eight months. And we see that the majority of people still has a very good uh, T cell and B cell and antibody response after that time point. So the question, of course, is like what happens after eight months? And the reason we stopped, uh, we, we reported up to eight months is because that's what we could collect at that time. Because when we did the study, people were at the most infected eight months ago. So, but all but we saw that 90% of the people still have multiple arms of the immune memory present, points that it's probably a very stable immune memory induced. So we, we are following up now 12 month samples, 18 month samples when, uh, when we get the time point. So, but it, it looks actually very promising. And we know from the, the SARS. I know it's not called SARS-1, but the original SARS, that people have been seeing memory responses, memory teaser responses after 17 years. So all of that um, makes us like um, confident and, uh, and hopeful that we see a long immune memory induced. Wow, well, thank you both so much. We have so many more questions. So I apologize to all our participants, but um, we'll just have to have you both back, I think, and, uh, and delve even further into this topic. But um, really, really do appreciate it. So thank you both for these excellent presentations. Um, and it's just really, we appreciate your time for sharing this work with our audience and for answering the questions that we got to. Um, thanks to all our attendees for participating too and submitting such great questions for our speakers. We're really so fortunate to have such an engaged audience for these lab meetings. Um, and with that, I'll invite you to join us two weeks from today on July 1st for the next global COVID lab meeting. And our speaker that day will be Dr. Pamela Bjorkman from Caltech. Her presentation will focus on neutralizing antibodies against coronaviruses. And if you're interested in more research on COVID-19, please sign up for the HVP COVID Report, a bi-weekly newsletter that provides insights from experts around the globe and highlights the latest scientific articles and data. Finally, please visit our website and follow us on LinkedIn, where we will upload a recording of today's webinar. And with that, I'll say thank you again so much for participating today, stay safe, and we hope that you'll join us on the next Global COVID Lab Meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.